All selling is is change, okay? Now, here's your problem. Human beings do not like change, even though we say we do. Okay, so think about that for a second. All selling is change. All selling is change, right? Because they're just changing to something different. So they're even want, they're either wanting something better or they're moving away from pain. That's what selling is, right? It's usually a combination of both. But human beings don't like change. Now, why do we not like change? Because for the most part, it makes us feel very uncomfortable and unsettled, especially when that's initiated by some pushy salesperson who's trying to push you know, their solution down our throat, okay? So human behavior repeatedly shows that we value something that is more consistent and something that is more familiar over something that is new and foreign to us, even if we don't like it that much. And, and I always talk about that. Think about the battered spouse syndrome. We always wonder like, well, why does she keep going back to that guy if, if you know, she if he's verbally abusing her or physically abusing her? Do you know why she keeps, I mean, it could be he or she, do you know why that other spouse keeps going back? Because they're afraid of change. They're afraid of the unknown. That's why they do that. That is. And that's, that is so, you know, I'll jump in real quick because it is the, extremely valid. You know, with what I do with our, I call it my day job on that show because it's separate from what I do with the the show. But with Vision 33, we sell ERP and you get to be talking, you know, micro sales at 25 grand, but typically Somewhere 150 to 500, 600,000 is probably your average deal size right now. And with that, you have some people that at this point, they've been working at the company for 25, 30, 40, even 40 years plus at this point, And they've been using the same software since like the 80s. Okay. And while the owner or the executive, or maybe now it's the owner's kid who's going to be taken over, like, hey, look, it worked good, but we're not going to be able to keep growing with this solution. We need a new solution for growth. And that's where he sold. But you have everybody else under them like, no, 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 don't buy it. Don't buy it. Like, I like my green screen. You know, I don't I don't want to change the windows. You got you got influence. That owner might be the ultimate decision maker. This is a whole new set we're talking about now. However, if you're in a more of a B2B complex sound environment, which would you, you just described there. There's not like one decision maker. Even if that person is the only one that makes the ultimate decision, there are other influencers that could influence that individual to make a decision one way or the other. It could be the, you know, you're talking about software. It could be the head of IT that's like, ah, you know, they, they don't want to change because they feel like. A lot of times it's, it's like the COO, the COO, for example, operations, it could be financial, CFO. It, it, it could be. Maybe they don't want to change because maybe they feel like they don't want to take the time to train people on how to use it. They, they feel like it could take too much time to ramp it. They feel like, you know, just whatever. You know, that, that's an extremely valid point, like the time to ramp it, because you have to remember an implementation, especially once you start talking about software services and stuff like that, it's a shared implementation. So even though you hired us to implement it, guess what? I don't know if your data is right or correct. You guys have to kind of validate that and validate that these processes that we're implementing work for you. So it is a shared implementation. So that means that during the course of implementation, they're not working two jobs, but they're working one and a half jobs because they still have to survive as a company while they're undergoing this implementation. Well, and that's why as a sales professional, you have to understand you're not just really speaking to the decision maker or makers. You need to also be able to speak to people who can't make the decision, but can definitely influence that decision maker. Hey, I call that group, I mean, you have your champion, obviously, which would be like the key, key individual that's like, yeah, you know, you guys got to buy them. Uh, but then I, I I call them the key stake, stakeholders. You know, how many of those people do we have on board? And if we don't have them on board, why don't we have them on board? Well, you want to find out. Okay, but help me understand, Dana. Like, who who would actually be involved in actually implementing this just so I have a better understanding? See, I want to know. I'm not going to say who, who who's involved in the decision-making process. Not yet. I'm going to find out who's also involved in implementing it, who's involved in training it. Like, I know I have to get them on board as well. And then finally, I might say, you know, instead of saying, well, who besides you is the decision maker? Because that's just cheesy and everybody asks that question. I want to open them up and I might reword that and say, John, can you can you walk me through your company's, I guess, decision making process when it comes to solving problems like this? Walk me through Oh, well, I have to talk with this person over here or I have to. And now I'm starting to get more of a, 
an overview of what really is going on in this organization. So it causes me, the salesperson, to have better control of that account. Whereas most salespeople just like present and like hope it works out. You don't want to take that hopium drug. It doesn't pay very well. Yeah, the hopium, lay off the hopium, 